Well, welcome. In this video, as you can see, we're going to be talking about binomial probabilities. Now, let's first make sure we understand what a binomial experiment is. We've looked at binomial experiments before. Um, like, for example, when we expanded out um, h plus t to the fifth power, um, dealing with the number of times of tossing a uh, fair coin five times and getting heads and tails, that was an example of a binomial experiment. Now, there are five properties of binomial experiments that are described for us here. The first uh, property is that they're, that by all binomial experiments are going to be repeated situations called trials. Um, so, again, every time that we do an experiment, we call that a trial. So that's a term to be familiar with. The second property is that there's always going to be a fixed number of trials, meaning they're not going to go on infinitely. So, for example, you might have a trial that would have uh, 50 occurrences, or you might do an experiment 100 times, so you'd have 100 trials. Um, so it's always going to be a fixed amount. Uh, for each trial, there's always going to be two possible outcomes. You can either have a failure or a success. Now here it's telling us that they would refer to a failure as F and a success as S. But in reality, for a formula that we're going to be looking at in a little bit, we're going to use P to represent the probability of a success and Q as a probability of a failure. The next property is that the uh, probability of success is going to be the same in each trial. So, it's not going to be so the probability of a success is not going to change from one trial to the next. And also that each trial is going to be independent of each other. So what happens for the first trial has no impact on what's going to happen on the next trial. So those are five properties of a binomial experiment. And you're going to have here, you're going to have an example of a um, binomial experiment in this table. But the next thing we're going to be looking at is a formula that we're going to be using to find uh, these different uh, probabilities. So that, let's look at that experiment, or let's look at that uh, uh, equation, and then let's look at some different examples that illustrate how we would find the probability of a binomial experiment. Okay, so yeah, as you can see here from this table, that it's an experiment, or this is a binomial experiment with four different trials. So if we had four different trials, you could have a situation where we have zero successes, so that means we, all, we have all fa failures. The number of times that that would happen is just one time. The uh, Getting one success, well, that would happen four different times. Having two successes in four trials, well, that would happen six. There, there could be six different outcomes for that. And having three successes, again, there would be four, success, four um, outcomes for that. And having all four successes in four trials would happen. There's just one outcome for that. So that's just an illustration so you can see what a binomial experiment the results could look like. Now to find the probability of exactly a certain number of successes is found in this binomial probability theorem. So again in this theorem it's important to note that K is representing the number of successes. P remember represents the probability of a success. So that makes sense that K the number of successes would be tied to the probability of a success. And Q represents the probability of a failure. And so the exponent, just like we were talking about with the binomial theorem, the exponents here have to add out to be the total number for N, in this case, the total, total number of trials. The exponents here, so we always want to make sure that those exponents add up to be the total number of trials. So let's look at an example. We're going to use that, uh, theor that theorem. It says, if Suppose the probability of a heart pacemaker working flawlessly for one year is 0.85. What is the probability that two patients out of four receiving pacemakers this week will have some kind of problem with their pacemakers over the next year? Well, the start out with the fact that they say that a heart, uh, a pacemaker working flawlessly for one year, the probability of that happening is 0.85. That is the probability of our success. So we're going to say that our value for P, the probability of a success, so in this case a heart uh, pacemaker working flawlessly, is going to be 0.85. Well, on the flip side of that then, our value for Q, our probability for a failure, would be that it would not work flawlessly, would be 0.15. Because 1 minus 0.85 would give us the rest of that 0.15. 
So now using that, or, or the question is asking us, um, what is the probability that two patients out of four uh, will have some kind of problem? Well, the flip side of that would be that two out of four would not have any problems. That's what we always want to look at when we're working with this formula. Remember, K is referring to the number of successes. That's what we want to look at this as. So the probability in this case would be of two successes in four trials would be found by doing this. We would take the fact that we have four trials, and we're going to have two successes before choose two. Then we would take that 0.85 and square it because our value for K here would be two. And that value for 2 would be the same. Multiply that times our failures, 0.15, or the probability of a failure, which is 0.15. And then we would have, if we have two successes, then we're going to have two failures. So that would be 0.15 being squared as well. Well, 4 choose 2 is 6. So on your calculator, you could just do 4 choose 2 times 0.85 squared, times 0.15 squared, or instead use 6 instead of 4 choose 2. Regardless, you get your answer, which would be 0.15. 0.975 or 9.75%. Let's look at the next example together. Some hereditary diseases are inherited by one-fourth of the offspring of the families in which the hereditary genes is present. In such a family, if such a family has four offspring, what is the probability that exactly one of the offspring inherits the gene? So we know that one-fourth of the children could have the disease. We're going to call that the success. So in this case, our value for P is going to be 0.25 or 1 fourth. That would be the fact that they inherit the gene. So Q would be the failure, the probability of having a failure, which is not inheriting the gene, which is going to happen 3 fourths of the time, or 0.75. So now we're going to look for, the question says, find the probability that exactly one of the offspring inherits the gene. So that's what we're looking for. So our value for k here is going to be 1. So it's going to be 4 choose 1 because we have four children. And we're going to have, we want to find the probability of one of them having the gene. So we would use that value for p of 0.25 to the first power then. And then our 0.75 would be cubed. So we would have one child. We want to find the probability of exactly one child not having it. I'm sorry, one child having the disease. So that means there would be three that would not have it. And if you did that on your calculator, you'd end up with 0.422 or 42.2% chance of exactly one of their children having the disease. Let's look at another one together. Suppose a quiz has 10 multiple choice questions, each with five choices. If a student guesses randomly on each question, what is the probability the student will get seven or more correct? So with this one, a success would be guessing and getting one of the choices correct, which is going to be, since there's five choices, you'd have one in five or a 0.2 chance of that happening. So a failure then would be getting a wrong answer, which is going to happen four out of the five. So four out of the five choices are wrong. So a 0.8 chance of that happening. So what is the probability of guessing and getting seven or more correct? Well, the fact that we're looking at not just getting exactly seven, we're looking at getting seven or more, means that we're going to have to do this multiple times. So let's start out by finding the probability of getting seven correct answers. Well, to do that, we would take 10 choose seven, because there's 10 questions. We're going to be trying to find the probability of getting seven of them correct. So since we our probability of getting, getting um, one correct answer is 0.2, this would be 0.2 to the seventh power. So that means that getting them wrong, the 0.8 is going to be raised to the third power. Because again, these two should total our number, which would be 10. Well, that's the probability of getting 7 correct. Remember, the question says the probability of getting 7 or more correct. So now we're going to take, oh, by the way, that would be 0 0.00786. So now we're going to take the probability of getting 8 correct, which would be 10 choose 8. Then we would take 0.28, or 0.2 to the 8th power. And then we'd have 0.8 being squared. And if you do that on your calculator, you get 0 0.000. So a decimal followed by four zeros and seven four. Now we're going to do this again for the probability of getting nine correct, which would be 10 choose nine, followed by, multiply that by 0.2 to the ninth power, and multiply that by 0.8. When you do that, you get a decimal followed by five zeros and a four. 
And lastly, we're going to find the probability of getting 10 correct, which would be 10 choose 10, which would be 1, times 0.2 to the 10th power, times 0.8 to the 0 power, so that doesn't affect anything. But when you do that, you get six zeros followed by a 1. Now, the problem says to find the probability of getting seven or more correct. Remember from uh, what we've learned about previously with probabilities, anytime we talk about the word or, that means we're going to add up each of these values. So if I add these all together, I get 0 0.000864. Or if we did it as a percent, it would be 0.0864%. So there you have it. That is how we use uh, this uh, binomial probabilities. And the key is to make sure that you know this theorem. So that's a few different ways that we can apply that theorem. So hopefully that made sense to you. So good luck now as you work on your assignment.